Recently, uh, we had, I had a friend of mine that's been a friend of mine for a long time come to visit, and uh, he was joking with me and said, um, wow, you're kind of like the campus mom around here. And uh, I know we talked about Kim Stewart being that. I gladly share that with her. But I, I'm kind of having a campus mom moment with you right now. That I'd like to ask you if you would get off your cell phones, if you have your earbuds in, if you would take those out. Um, I believe that what the stories that you're going to hear today are important to all of us. They help shape us into understanding who God is. And um, I just think also that God really wants to meet us here today. I think God wants to meet us here every day that we've gathered together. And so I'd like to ask you to do that right now. Uh, we've been doing Barclay Community Stories, uh, maybe two or three each semester. And today uh, we have two different stories. Um, I sent out an email around maybe January just asking, does anybody have a story about a journey of prayer? I didn't necessarily say answer prayer. I just said a journey of prayer. And President Frazier actually hit me up first and said, I have a story about prayer. And some of you may not even know this because you've only been here this year. But part of uh, Royce and Carolyn's journey is Carolyn having cancer. And so he's going to share some of that today. And also we have Keith and Debbie White, um, as some of you may know, who are in the middle of a cancer journey. And so Royce told me that um, he's never shared this story before publicly. And so I'd like to ask if you would just take a moment to pray for him as he comes up. Um, it's hard to do. So let's do that. And as he's coming up, just say a prayer for him. Father, would you walk me through this? Allow me to unveil your majesty, who you are, the God of the universe, and our Savior. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Um, as Brocky says, I've never shared this journey, and uh, Carolyn had cancer in 2016, so you can do the math five years, so five years, and it's still really, really fresh. Uh, our stories are quite different, obviously. Her story is, can I survive the next minute? And my story was, don't take the most precious thing that you've given me. So bear with me because I'm going to be a mess, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to take you to some pretty private, sacred places that I've walked, and again, I'm going to take you to some places I've never shared before with anybody outside of my family. Um, Brocky asked, one of the first questions she asked me was, uh, you and Carolyn are very private people. Why did you decide to invite the community into the process? And uh, my answer to that is Carolyn's sister, Shirley, um, had a conversation with us right after we first found out. Shirley and her husband were pastors in Southern California. And uh, Shirley said this. She said, you need to share your journey so people can watch pe Jesus go to work. So that's what we committed to do. And uh, that's why I'm here this morning. Another question was, how did you find out? So let me just walk through. I'm just going to read through journal entries um, that I've made. On February the 2nd, um, we did physicals today, not what we expected. We're now living with the C word. The next two journal entries are about two very sacred things. And again, I've only shared this with my family, but they're they're mystical and they run deep in me. This morning after the CAT scan, Carolyn talked about how she could feel it growing, shooting fingers up through her body. Um, she had a mass in her lower abdomen and uh, she asked the doctor what it was and we went in and did some, some scans and stuff. And when doctors start coming in whispering, you know something's going on. Um, 
Let me first say that I don't often dream that I'm aware of or remember dreams. Second, as a psychologist, I'm aware about how powerful the mind is. But the night after the news, um, I had a dream. The surgeon came out of the operation and she said, we're going to box it up and get it out. It's all contained. We're going to fold it up like a suitcase and get it out of here. That dream stood in direct contrast to Carolyn's words and the feelings of that day. It was a dream that went completely against my own consciousness and subconscious fears and anticipations. It was a dream, but was it a word from the Lord? It went totally against my human expectation and thinking. If dreams are a part of my subconscious, this was not a part of my subconscious thinking and the fears as I drifted off to sleep that night. The next night, February the 5th, in the middle of the night, I woke up clearly and was impressed that Royce You pray every day that God will keep his hand of protection around you and Carolyn, your children, your grandchildren, and the college. This is going to be an example of that protection. That Carolyn's growth is contained. God has answered your prayers. I cannot say it was a voice of God or simply an impression, but it was very, very clear and a conscious moment in the middle of the night. It was as if I had been spoke, it is, it is a, as if it had been spoken to me. It's not something I had con that I had consciously thought about. It was as if the Holy Spirit woke me and spoke these words of reassurance and promise to me. I'm humbled, grateful, and praising God for his graciousness to me and Carolyn. Rocky asked me what I found in my prayer process. During the first few days, I found myself waking early in the morning, three or four o'clock. I'd slip on my sweats. I'd kneel at a chair in our bedroom and prayed and cried and prayed over Carol. I felt helpless. My understanding about prayer and healing, I didn't know. I would pray until I fell asleep on my knees. I figured God was done with me at that point. <laughs> there were four passages that uh, really became, began to live in me. The first one is Luke 8, 43, uh, 43 to 48. And a woman w was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. When they all denied, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding around, pressing against you. But Jesus said, Jesus said someone touched me. I know that power has gone out. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told him she'd been touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her daughter, your faith has, made, has healed you. Go in peace. This was a person who had no contact with Jesus, no eye-to-eye -eye contact, but her faith was so powerful, all she had to do was touch the hem of his garment. I want to be like this lady. I want to chase after Jesus every day. <laughs> I want to grab the hem of his garment. The second passage is Mark 9, 20 to 29. Unfortunately, it's more representative of me. So they brought him. When the Spirit saw Jesus, it uh, immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell into the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long, is it, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered, it has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Now, Jesus kind of is, retorts him. At the, he kind of mocks him a bit. And Jesus says, if I can, like if I can, I mean, do you know who you're talking to? If I can? 
If I can, Jesus says, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father explained, exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw the crowd was uh, uh, running to the scene, um, he rebuked the spirit. You deaf and dumb spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, this is me. Praying and praying, and yet there's a, that little bit of doubt that sits there. And that's me. I want to be like the woman that touched his room <laughs> and without a doubt was healed. But I find myself like the father here. The next one is a, a passage. You know, if God is God and if I pray and if I believe, shouldn't I just be done with that? Should I just stop? Or do I keep asking? I mean, that was a, that was a tension I was having as I... As I um, journeyed this. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door's already locked. My children are all in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you any bread because of friendship, Yet, because of your shameless audacity or persistence, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, and this verse we often quote, but without the previous passage. So I say to you, ask and will be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be open. So I determined to just have shameless audacity. And so every day I go to the Father and I ask for healing. And that journey has been going on for five years now, every day, to ask for healing for Carolyn, for ask for healing for people. I'm, I pray for people in this institution, my colleagues, but I just want to have that shameless audacity to always persist. The next one is Luke 5.20. Um, this is when the friends bring the guy to Jesus, the paralyzed per, uh, guy, and they find they can't get in, and they let him down through the roof. And this is the passage. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof, and they lowered him on a mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Jesus did not see the paralytic and say, hey, you have faith. Remember the father with the son? The son was possessed. The son couldn't ask for that, but the father asked. And you will find time and time again through scripture that it's not the person who needs healed that's being, that is asking for it. It is people around them that bring them to them. And Jesus, seeing the, the faith of the friends, healed the paralytic. So that gave me tremendous hope that in my journey with Carolyn that it was not on her shoulders, but it was on my shoulders. That as her husband and as her friend, that it was on my shoulders to pray healing on her and to bring healing to her. And finally, always remembering who I'm praying to, Colossians 1, 15 and 16. The Son is the image of the invisible God and the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. I am praying to the God of the universe, the most magnificent entity, person, that I can pray to. And that's who I'm praying to. That's who I'm asking. Well, um, Casey put up the timeline real quick here. Um, 
I think this is the next slide. So our, our I don't know, when, when you go through all this stuff, there tends to be these tremendous lags in time. Um, so our first uh, response after Dr. Fowler found it on Tuesday was uh, Dr. Morgan's office scheduled Carolyn for an appointment on March 8th, a month later. Dr. Fowler called the office, Dr. Morgan's office, says she doesn't have a month. She needs an appointment next week. They said, how about Friday? So we were, had an appointment three days later. I'm thankful for Dr. Fowler's watchful eye over us. Um, a year later, Dr. Fowler told me he didn't think Carolyn would make it to Christmas. I'm glad he kept that thought to himself. So we have an appointment. We go see Dr. Morgan on the 5th. Dr. Morgan asked Carolyn on that day, what are you doing Monday? You're scheduled for surgery. So we go, in, we, we go from Tuesday to finding out to Monday, the next Monday, and we're in surgery. Wow, what a God. How does that happen? The night before our appointment with Dr. Morgan, I was reminded of the words that I received and would see an answer to the prayer, the prayer for protection from the Lord on February the 5th. On February the 8th, Carolyn comes through the surgery well. There was a mass on her appendix. They took out two foot of her colon, a hysterectomy, and um, the mass was about the size of a cantaloupe and there was a half gallon of gel-like fluid substance that they removed. Dr. Morgan said I'd never seen anything like that before. The next week I opened a patient, same thing. Saw it twice in two weeks. Um, there were some abnormal cells in the fat lining of the intestine and they couldn't remove and they are con of concern. In the surgery room, the gastrointestinal specialist surgeon was in the next bay awaiting his surgeon. Dr. Morgan opened Carolyn up and saw she would need a sectioning of her large intestine, stepped over and said, hey, you want to come over and do this? So we got the best. That's an answer to prayer. The specialist was standing waiting in the next bay. March 1st, we get the results back from... Uh, Mayo Clinic. Carcinoma cells are like all cancer cells, but carcinoma are the abnormal cells that divide without control. The report's back from the Mayo Clinic. We're taken into the um, exam room. I'm given a chair next to the counter. Carolyn's on the table. I look to my right, and on the counter is a report from the Mayo Clinic. I'm skimming down through the report, section one, da-da-da-da, no carcinoma. Section two, da-da-da-da, no carcinoma. Section three, da-da-da, no carcinoma. What's on page two? There's a page two. Answer to prayer number four. Dr. Morgan informs us that the pathology report stated that it's a low-grade tumor and falls under the umbrella of cancer. It's very rare. All I hear is when she says, no carcinoma. The neoplasm could flare up again in the future. The solution would be to repeat the surgery and remove any growth. Dr. Morgan is suggesting that we get a second opinion um, from a doctor that specializes in appendicle cancer. There's a radical new treatment. She doesn't do it. It's available in MD Anderson, Houston, Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, and KU Cancer Research Center in Kansas City. We're thinking we're done. We like the ready to live life part. We don't want a second opinion. We're scheduled to go to Kansas City for a second opinion. We went to the parking lot and sat in our car and cried. We got a miracle. 32 days later, we're in Kansas City. Our consultant is Dr. Alcas Foulos, the University of Kansas Cancer Research Center. Dr. Al presents Carolyn with, is, has pre presented Carolyn's case to the research uh, meeting. That's where all the cancer doctors sit around and uh, discuss the case and confirm treatment and so forth. 
A number of times during the consult, Dr. Alm smiles at us and says, I am the expert. Carol and I kind of laugh at that. He was trying to calm our questions and remind us that this isn't his first rodeo. Regarding the surgery, he says, I've done it a hundred times. It's one time uh, treatment, hot chemo circulated. Casey, pull up the next slide. Um, and circulating the abdomen, it's uh, one and done. So the high peck, the high peck is this. Um, here's the chemo here. It's liquid. It goes through this heater. Actually, they cut her from stern to sternum, uh, sternum to stern, from here to here. And they clean everything out. They do the surgery to clean everything out. And then they and then they put two tubes in her and they sew her all back up. And then they run this hot chemo, 104 degrees in here, fill it up, slosh it around, and for 90 minutes they run this hot chemo. Comes out, goes back through the chemo reservoir, back through the heater, and back into her, into her abdomen. And they do that for 90 minutes, and there are people sloshing her, actually moving her on the table, sloshing her back and forth. We thought that was kind of weird, and thought, yeah, they don't, really don't do that. And Todd and Brocky's uh, oldest son is at KU Med Center doing his residency, and guess who he's working with? Dr. Alcas Foulis. And he says, yeah, that's what we really do. They slosh you around. And so slosh her around 90 minutes. Then they open her back up, take all the stuff out. Then they irrigate it, which means they just wash it out, clean it out. And then they sew her back up again and then take her to, to ICU. So a fun little exercise and something she got to participate in. You ought to ask her about it sometime. Um, So I've done this surgery hundreds of times. It's one and done treatment. Carolyn asked Dr. Al, what's the shortest time someone has been in and out of surgery and out? He's telling us we have to be there two weeks. Dr. Al said he had a 20-something male that was out in seven days. Oh, no. I can see Carolyn's eyes narrowing. Game is on. Wrong answer, Dr. Al. Answer to prayer number five, later we found out through um, Todd's son that Dr. Al really is world renowned in this area. How did we get so fortunate to have Dr. Al? Another answer to prayer, it's a sacred moment we had no control over. On April the 5th, Dr. Al calls Carolyn on a Tuesday night, unexpected to visit with her a busy surgeon who makes home phone calls at 9 o'clock in the evening. For 30 minutes, he pleaded with her, please have the surgery. It will save your life. We traveled to Kansas City on the 20th, for April 20th, for a consult. On May the 16th, we go for the surgery. We're up at 4.30 a.m., check in the KU Med Center at 5.30. Carolyn's in surgery by 7.30. The three to four hour surgery lasts till 4 o'clock in the afternoon, eight hours. Dr. Al visits with uh, Shelby and me and stated that there was a lot more disease than he expected. They removed the diseased tissue, the spleen, the gallbladder, lining of the diaphragm, and did the high peck treatment to destroy the hiding microcells, circulating 104 degree chemo through her abdomen for 90 minutes while people rocked her on the operating table, sloshing the chemo through her abdomen. My daughter Shelby and Cora, 28 days old, came and sat with me, and Todd Follett drove down from Grinnell, Iowa. Who does that? To sit in a waiting room and just keep me company. Those are special people in special times. Thanks, Shelby and Todd. Answer to prayer six. Shelby and I met with Dr. Al Kaspoulos post-op. His statement was, we got it all. Dr. Al said if she'd waited two months to do the surgery, things would have been much worse. He said it was good we did it when we did. Carolyn went through some tremendous, incredible um, post-op. Um, she mentioned the first day of post-op, it's worse than having 10-pound babies without medication. Um, there's a tube, tube down her, her throat that triggers her gag reflex. Um, she can't eat or drink. This is already day four since she last ate. They have an IV solution for, um, to keep her um, hydrated. 
Uh, Dr. Said, Al says it'll probably be Thursday, six days before she ever eats or drinks on her own. Amazing. I wonder how she does it. I wonder how people live through this. On Wednesday, um, I, I'm, I'm just praying that, that God will just allow her intestines to start working, that they get rid of the tube. Friday morning, I walk in, answer to prayer number seven. I walk into ICU. They tell me Carolyn's in a room. We're in a room. We're out of ICU. The tubes are out. Chicken broth for breakfast. It must feel like Thanksgiving dinner for Carolyn. This is a good day. Day seven, for some reason, Carolyn's oxygen level is not staying up. It dropped to 30 to 83 to 84. Dr. Al says it's due to the stripping of the diaphragm. Apparently, this is common. The resident visited with me in the hallway to say that if things don't improve tomorrow, they'll insert a small tube in her side to relieve the pressure. When her oxygen level is normal, they'll remove the tube, and she will be in the hospital for a few more days. Everything looks good but the oxygen level. Answer to prayer number seven. And I've never shared this outside of my family. This evening, I emailed the kids and asked for prayer for Carolyn's oxygen level to rise. I'm sitting at the end of her bed. I'm facing Carolyn. The oxygen monitor is on her left. It reads 83, 84, 83, 84. Father, heal Carolyn. This is your thing, healing, so take over. I'm praying. I text the kids, pray. Her oxygen level starts rising. 85, 86, 85, 86, 86, now 87. 86, 87, 86, 87. I'm texting the kids. Oxygen level is rising. Keep praying. 87, 88, 89. 88, 89, I'm watching miracle. Most amazing thing I've ever witnessed. No one's going to believe this. Not sure I believe this. 87, 88, 89, 90, we hit 90. 91, 92, 93, I'm cheery. Kids keep praying. I've never watched a miracle before. The next day, Tuesday, I walk in the hospital room, no oxygen tube. Carolyn's oxygen level stayed up all night. How come? They don't know. I know. There are angels in this room, and God made a visit. He also is doing rounds. This is day eight. She didn't break the record. As a side note to close, I would just say that during this 2016 year was also, remember I prayed for protection for my family in this college. That 2016 year was the last push of fundraising to build this building. You depend on the president to be a part of that. In 2016, I think Satan did everything he could to, to just lay this thing to rest. But we built the building. We started in 2017. What have I learned? I have uh, much learned about prayer. I don't know. I don't understand it all. I know we're all going to die. This is not our internal, um, this is not, we are not eternal beings in these bodies. Jesus died and rode to prepare, rose to prepare a place for us, an internal place. This is not it. Earthly healing is not God's ultimate plan, but it's, but I'm still praying for healing. It's a paradox. I don't understand. I pray a lot. Every day I pray for Carolyn and others healing. There are about 20 people on my prayer list. Some I've prayed for have died. If you remember Shirley, Carolyn's sister Shirley talking to us, she discovered she had cancer later that same year. She passed away in 2018. I prayed for Shirley. I believed and prayed for her just like I did for Carolyn. But I know God's sovereign and he makes those calls, not me. I just pray. I don't understand. Two friends were in a hospital with COVID and both expected to die. People came, their family came to their windows to, to bid them farewell. Both recovered. Answers to prayer. Praise God for his mercy. Others have not been healed. It presses on me even more, and I don't understand. Each day I press into the crowd of busyness and simply to touch the hem of Jesus' robe. I know he has power to heal. If I can just touch him in faith, his power will move. Maybe he says each day, who touched me? I raise my hand and say, it was me. 
Whatever keeps you awake at nights, God wants to be there. He wants you to approach him with persistence and shameless audacity. He's walking through your life close enough for you to reach out and touch him. So touch him. He'll turn and he'll say, who touched me? That's when you raise your hand and say, it was me. Am I on? We're going to go off script a little bit here, where we plan to go, and I think it's okay. Um, we're okay with that? Keith says okay. <laughs> if you guys don't know, this is Keith and Debbie White. Um, Keith is uh, chair of, was chair of our psychology department. He's planning on retiring this year, semi-retiring. And then um, this is his bride, Debbie. And um, how long have you guys been married? Eight months. <laughs> okay. Stop and think. Yeah. Okay. And then um, maybe you could tell us a little bit of uh, just briefly right now, like uh, how did you guys get together, and um, maybe a little bit about uh, both of you have lost a spouse. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> well, I lost uh, my spouse of forty-four years in two thousand sixteen. My experience was different than Debbie's, is that um, uh, my wife's health had been failing for about five years. And so I went through a grieving process before she passed. Um, and so it was, it was not unexpected. And uh, she passed in July of 2016. Uh, Debbie, on the other hand, um, Lost her husband of 43 years um, by a, a motorcycle accident. And so it was a total shock for her. And uh, uh, in September, in September, uh, September 28th of 2016. Right. So our spouses died two months apart. Right. So uh, about two years later, I sensed a, a desire to remarry, and uh, so I prayed about it and asked the Lord. I said, Lord, if it's your will, um, I'd ask that you'd bring me a, a ministry partner. And uh, so um, eventually he brought Debbie to mind. I started uh, texting her. We, we knew each other in college. We just happened to marry other people, you know. <laughs> uh, we were in Greek class together, by the way, so. <laughs> anyway. Um, so uh, I was texting her. She was, she was uh, down in uh, Brazil um, visiting her son and, and his family. And then... Uh, uh, on her way back, she stopped at a conference, and I texted her, and I said, can I call you? And that was upsetting. It was like, was like wait a minute. <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> so, uh, I don't know, do you want to tell a little bit of the story? <laughs> 
Uh, so he uh, he had texted me, uh, or emailed me uh, after Gary's accident and expressed condolences. And just every six or eight months, he'd say, how's it going? You know, and I thought, and of course, and I think it was just a friend checking on a friend, you know, uh, because we were going through the same stages of grief. And, and uh, so when the texting began a little more, Often, I didn't truly didn't think anything about it. You know, he he left out the part that I made his wife's wedding dress. Yeah. And he, one day he text. I can't remember. He texted or said it when we were talking. He said, "Did you know you were at my wedding?" <laughs> I said, "Yes, I did." <laughs> So, um, and then that's when I told him I made Hope's wedding dress. And he said, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> you know? So anyway, so when the texting became a little more often, I, I didn't really think anything about it. It was just a friend, you know. And, um, but when he said, can I call you when you get back to the States? Then I went, oh boy, what's going on here? <laughs> you know, maybe we've taken a turn. Uh, I didn't know. <laughs> I was pretty nervous. <laughs> I... Because frankly, I, it never once entered my mind to remarry. It never once entered my brain. I lived in Oregon. My whole world was in Oregon. My kids were all over. Uh, I had a life. I, it just never occurred to me. So when he wanted to talk, I was like, oh, boy. You know, so, <laughs> so we had our first conversation, and it was fun. So then we had a second conversation. Then they got to be a couple hours long. And, and then on August the 6th, and I remember it very plainly, uh, Keith said to me, um, I'm going to put my cards on the table. <laughs> I, I was like, oh, breathe, breathe. <laughs> you know, what cards are we talking about here? <laughs> and so... Uh, he said, I'm interested in remarrying, and uh, I would like to pursue uh, getting to know you more. And I, in my head, I'm going, oh, God, help me not to say the wrong thing, and, you know, but I, I just didn't know what to do. And I said, uh, uh, I think I said I was honored, uh, but let's just get to know each other a little bit better, you know. And then I stopped eating and sleeping. I just, <laughs> I was a wreck. Because when you get married the first time, you just have your parents to consider. You know, maybe a sibling, but not really. You don't even think about them. But, um, <laughs> but when you get married uh, at our age, there are children and married children and grandchildren and you own a house and there's all sorts of things to consider. So I just was, I was totally a basket case at home. Of course, the phone calls continued. I continued to enjoy them. We were learning about each other and, and, uh, but when he said that, boy, I just, I was a mess. And so I just, earnestly started seeking the Lord on this. And I said, uh, am, are we going too long? It's, it's, so I earnest, earnestly sought the Lord. And uh, something my pastor said that very next Sunday, he said, say yes until the Lord says no. And that spoke to my heart. And I said, OK, I can do that. And there was peace. So two days later, Keith says, would you mind if we started praying together? And I went, <laughs> uh, OK. <laughs> because that forms a bond, and I knew that. But then the Lord said, say yes until I say no. So about three weeks later, and we're talking to each other every day, and praying every day. Three weeks later, I said, Lord, why am I such a mess? Because I'm still not eating and sleeping. And the Lord, I heard immediately, as clear as a bell in my head, maybe you don't trust me. 
Oh boy. So I, I determined to shut up and to just follow a step at a time and keep saying yes until God says no. Because I was real sure he was going to say no. But I didn't want to hurt Keith by that time. You know, he's a nice guy. I didn't want to hurt him. And uh, so I already had a trip planned to come see my mother-in-law. And uh, I told Keith about it. And he, really? Well, my mother-in-law lives in Oklahoma. Really? <laughs> well, maybe you could stay for the auction or the sale. I can't remember. Yeah. And so I did. And then I, I really liked him. I started watching how he interacted with the college kids, how people interacted with him. And I thought, this is a good guy. And I stayed at Todd and Brockie's. They know I was a mess. I was a mess. <laughs> Keith would leave, and I just Keith, Keith was a mess, too, just by I the way. Just, <laughs> I was just like, oh, God, what are we doing? This is crazy. We can't do this, you know. Um, and, and the Sunday he was going to take me to the plane, um, he was standing there talking to Todd and Brocky, and I was just watching their interaction. And I heard, just like before, I heard inside my spirit, Deb, I only give good gifts. And then I said, okay, I'm all in. And there was peace like I had to have that was beyond my understanding. And, um, but there were a few surprises God didn't tell us. <laughs> And that's where, let's go there. I think it's really important for you guys to hear just how God was a part of them getting together, how Debbie was hearing the Lord, how Keith was hearing the Lord. And then we arrive to kind of the next step. Tell us um, about when you, what happened, how you got diagnosed, and um, how long had you guys been married when that happened? Well, we got married on June 27th. Um, and, uh, you know, enjoyed the fall. And um, I'd been having a cough for some time. And finally, we went into the doctor, and um, they gave me a CAT scan. And they said, well, uh, we found a spot in your lung, but it might just be an infection. So um, they gave, put me on antibiotics. I also thought it might be my heart med meds. And so they changed the heart meds. Um, this was in November. Yeah, in November. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, we were um, on our way to uh, the airport to fly to Oregon mm -hmm. for the holidays. It was uh, December, what, 15th? 15th. And uh, I was picking up some meds at uh, Walmart, got a phone call that says, no, we need to do a biopsy. So that uh, waited until we got back in first part of January. And um, so that's when we, it was confirmed that, that it, was, it was cancer, that sort of thing. And then, then I had a, a PET scan that showed that it had already progressed into my brain and into uh, uh, some of my bones. And so uh, that it was a fourth stage cancer. But then uh, we were praying that, uh, because my dad had um, uh, lung cancer, even though he, he never smoked either, um, you know, they were looking to see if it was genetic, and it was. And so uh, that was an answer to prayer that they were able to find the genetic marker. And um, so the chemo that I'm taking is a pill uh, that I take once a day instead of having to have an IV which is pretty rough on, on the person's body. So I think this is a little bit more gradual and, and easier to, to um, tolerate, that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, I, I just want to appreciate all the prayers and the, and the cards and the, the expressions of love and encouragement that I've received from y'all. It's just been really overwhelming. And uh, I know that... Uh, um, we have a, a Facebook page on, 
on my cancer journey and and there's over 700 people that have responded that they're praying for me and and we hear about more people all the time that tell us oh well our church is praying for you or this or that so it's it's just really encouraging there's just one thing i want to say um god clearly to me led us together and so when uh, I got the word that it was stage four. Keith was in the hospital, and I couldn't even be with him. And I thought, oh, God, you knew this when you gave me the go-ahead. Sometimes God calls you a place, doesn't tell you everything, that doesn't mean you're still not called. And he will give us and you the grace mm-hmm. to face the tough times that come. This is where God has called me to be. So when you say those marriage vows in sickness and in health, as Royce and Carolyn said, that's what it means. And so, one, I want to encourage you to be very thoughtful about your marriage partner and prayerful. And number two, that when you make those vows, God takes it seriously, and so do we. So do do our families. You know, and I said to Ben, I said, Ben's uh, living in my house in Oregon. Your son. My son. When I said... They already complete each other's sentences. Isn't it cute? (laughs) Only eight months, and you can do this, too. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, but I said to Ben, I said, well, maybe, you know, Keith can stay here and, and do because every week he has to go in for something. And I said, maybe I can just fly back to Oregon, you know, for a couple weeks, because our original plan was to spend the summers in Oregon. And Ben says, Mom, you cannot do that. This is your husband. Isn't that awesome? Such an answer to prayer. So that's it. Well, here's what I want us to do today, just as we close. Um, I would like um, if some people would gather around this section around Royce and Carolyn. You know, you still have checkups. You still have checkups every year, right? And so we need to continue to pray for that. And if some of you would gather down here over um, Debbie and Keith, and um, then just, I want to invite over here, Todd, would you lead out in prayer over Royce and Carolyn? And Glenn, would you lead out in prayer over Debbie and Keith here? So I just want to invite you to move. Um, it's not like picking your favorite person, but just move as you desire to do that. And just as you're moving, I want to give a call out to you. If you need prayer for something, I think that you've heard stories of prayer today. Please feel free to reach out to me or even Keith and Debbie or Royce and Carolyn or anybody here that we would be happy to pray with you. So.